Chapter number thirty four of Molly's Prince. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Molly's Prince by Rosa Nushet Carey. Chapter thirty four. I have wanted my old sweetheart our doubts and our fears we are leaving before us the future uprears where angels a rainbow are weaving of smiles and of tears helen marion burnside during waveney's indisposition everett ward had been constantly at the red house and these visits had been full of consolation to both father and daughter althea's kindly welcome and womanly gentleness had from the first put him at his ease both she and doreen had cordially pressed him to repeat his visits and they gave waveney so much pleasure once when the sisters were out and waveney was making tea for him in the library she asked him suddenly why mr ingram never called at the red house i do not think it is quite kind and cousinly she said rather seriously everett seemed a little embarrassed by the question why you see he replied in rather a hesitating way ingram is so fully engaged he is up at our place regularly every morning and evening he does not seem able to exist away from it molly ought to consider herself a lucky little girl he continued thoughtfully for i never saw a man more deeply in love he is a fine fellow ingram the best-hearted fellow i know and i only hope and here he looked at waveney rather searchingly that our dear molly values him as he deserves i think molly is beginning to care for him returned waveney at least i fancy so but of course one can only guess at her feelings you see he has given her so much pleasure and she has learnt to depend on him so much for companionship and sympathy that it would be strange if she were to harden her heart against him at last but father her voice deepening with emotion do you think he is quite good enough for our sweet molly he is very kind and amusing our dear little monsieur blackie but everett interrupted her abruptly pshaw what a ridiculous name i think it is quite time that you and noel dropped it monsieur blackie indeed absurd i cannot imagine why you have all taken such a liberty with him everett spoke in such a ruffled tone that waveney stared at him in surprise but father dear he likes it he is as proud of the name as possible in his little notes to us he always signs himself monsieur blackie and then she added rather wickedly you know dear the name does not suit him so perfectly if he were tall and handsome and dignified we should have found him quite a different name but this explanation did not seem to please everard nonsense child he said quite sharply what do looks matter a good heart and a generous nature are worth far more some of the greatest men in the world were short of stature nelson and napoleon oh and many others but girls are so silly and sentimental they prefer some adonis six feet high with an empty purse and head waveney laughed merrily at this then a sudden thought came to her father she said rather gravely it is easy to see that mr ingram will have no difficulty with you and that you are his best friend has he and here she hesitated and flushed has he spoken to you yet i mean has he told you that he loves molly my little waveney that is not a fair question 
returned Everard quickly. But I suppose that there is no harm in telling you that I am most certainly in Ingram's confidence. Now, no more questions. He has begged me to respect his secret. Yes, rising from his seat and speaking with repressed excitement, he has my best wishes for his success. Now I must go, dear child, for I have promised to dine with him and Noel. When Everett had gone, Waveney sat down by the fire. The conversation had given her plenty of food for thought. Her father was in Ingram's confidence. It was evident that he fully approved of him as a prospective son-in-law, that Ingram's generosity and kindness of heart had won him over completely. I like him, she said to herself, and I think I could get fond of him as a brother, but in Molly's place, and here Waveney shook her head, the vision of a grave, strong face, with keen, thoughtful gray eyes, seemed to rise before her a quiet cultured voice vibrated in her ears while well, molly was welcome to her black prince to her there was only one man in the world and his name was thurgood chater this little talk had taken place two or three days before her interview with thurgood that sunday afternoon after that she thought less about mr ingram she was reading her own version of the old, old story, which most women read once in their lives, and though the opening chapter was headed, Waiting and Patience, it was none the less sweet and engrossing to the reader. There was something heroic to her in Thurgood silence and self-renunciation. He is great because he has learnt to conquer himself, she thought, most men are dominated by their own passions and prefer inclination to duty. And then, like a true woman, she reverenced him the more. It was the longest week that Waveney had ever passed. It seemed as though Thursday would never come. Althea had promised to have luncheon with Miss Mainwaring that day, so she proposed to drive Waveney over to Cleveland Terrace, about noon she had already made her preparations for the interview by sending molly the prettiest and daintiest blue dressing gown molly who was still very weak had shed tears over the gift but nurse helena had only laughed at her and made her try it on everett was in the studio touching up a picture that one of his pupils had painted when waveney entered she was rather pale and breathless how shabby and bare the dear old room looked to her after her long absence and yet in spite of its dinginess how she loved it oh father how nice it is to be here again she said softly as she stood near him and everett smiled and patted her cheek ingram left those flowers for you he said pointing to a charming bouquet on molly's little painting table he was so sorry that he could not wait and see you but he had to meet an old friend at his club but before waverley could make any reply to this or look at her flowers a pleasant-looking woman in nurse's garb entered she had a gentle face and kind eyes and waverley went up to her at once and took her hand you are my sister's nurse helena she said quickly thank you for all your care of molly may i see her soon certainly will you come with me now miss ward heard the carriage stop and she sent me down to bring you up at once i need not caution you she continued as they went upstairs to be very quiet as my patient is still weak she is on the new couch that mr ingram sent for her to use and i think you will say she looks very comfortable waveney was far too agitated to answer as nurse helena opened the door she heard molly's dear familiar voice say in weak accents wave darling is it really you and the next moment she was kneeling by the couch 
and she and Molly were clasped in each other's arms, and Molly's thin white cheek was wetted by her sister's tears. Wave, dear, you must not cry so, whispered Molly in a troubled voice. I am better, and Nurse Helena says that I get stronger every day. Then Waveney, ashamed of her want of self-control, and remembering the nurse's injunction, brushed away her tears and tried to smile. I have wanted my old sweetheart so badly, she faltered, and with difficulty she repressed a sob. In spite of her pallor, Molly looked lovelier than ever, almost too fragile and beautiful. Waveney thought, with that faint flush of excitement on her wasted cheeks, and the violet lines under her eyes. "'Not more than I have wanted you, darling,' returned Molly softly. "'Wave, I want to see your dear face more clearly. Look, Nurse Helena has put that seat close to me, so I can hold your hand, and we can talk comfortably. She is going to leave us alone for a quarter of an hour, and I have promised to be good and not tire myself.' Then, as Nurse Helena closed the door, Oh, Wave, it is almost worth all the pain and weariness to have such happiness as this. It is almost too good to be true, returned Waveney tenderly. Dear Molly, it has been such a dreadful time. If I could only have borne the pain for you, but to know you were suffering, and that strangers were nursing you, and I could do nothing, nothing, and faint shudder crossed her as she remembered those days of anguish and suspense. Hush, darling, replied Molly, but there were tears in her eyes. We will not talk about that sad time now. Do you think I did not know what my Waveney was feeling? That night I was so bad and I thought that perhaps I should die. I prayed that I might see you once more, and that we might bid each other goodbye. There, don't fret, for Waveney was kneeling beside her again, with her face hidden in the pillow. I only want to tell you how good Nurse Helena was to me, and how she comforted me. I was very miserable the next day, though I believe I was really better. And when Nurse Helena asked me what was troubling me, I told her it was because I was so wicked that I felt I could not be happy in heaven if my Waveney were breaking her heart about me here, and that with such feelings I was not fit to die. And she said in such a comforting way, But you are not going to heaven yet, my child so you need not trouble your head about leaving your sister. As for feeling wicked, well, we are none of us angels, but it is my belief that our Heavenly Father will not be angry with us for loving those he has given us to love. Oh, she is such a sweet woman. Wave, if you only knew her, you would like her as much as I do. Nurse Miriam was very kind, too, but she is not as nice as Nurse Helena. I love her already for being so good to my darling, returned Waveney, and then she tried to smile. Molly, dear, there is someone else to whom we owe gratitude. Then a swift, undefinable change passed over Molly's face. I know whom you mean she returned in a low voice, and father has told me how good he has been. It was Mr. Ingram who sent Sir Hindley down, and he made him come three times. Nurse Helena says his fees are tremendous, and that he is the greatest throat doctor in the world, and then he is paying for the nurses. I found that out the other day, and every day something comes, game and wine and fruit and flowers and yesterday this lovely couch oh wave somehow it oppresses me to think of it all 
for how is one to repay such kindness? We will think about that, dear, when you are stronger. Oh, we shall have so much to talk about and to plan, so you must make haste and get well, for I cannot do without my sweetheart any longer. Then Molly smiled, well satisfied. Oh, dear, how nice it will be, she said in rather a tired voice. Do you know, Wave? Miss Althina sent me a message by father the other day. She has promised to spare you to me whenever I want you, and when I go to the sea, you are to come too. This was news to Waveney. I have heard nothing about it. Are you quite sure? she asked doubtfully. Quite sure, returned Molly decidedly. But it was only settled last night. He mr ingram i mean and here molly spoke rather hurriedly and nervously was talking to father he said change of air was necessary after such an illness and that the doctor wished it and that i should never get strong without it and then father gave in and it was decided that i should go as soon as possible and that you and nurse helena were to come too oh there she comes as the nurse opened the door but i am sure our quarter of an hour is not up yet it is just twenty minutes observed nurse helena composedly just five minutes too long i can see by your face miss ward will you bid your sister good-bye please i should like her to be quiet for a little before her dinner yes you must go wave observed molly with ready submission but you are to have dinner with father before you go back and i am to see you again on sunday and then the sisters kissed each other silently but as waveney turned on the threshold for a last look molly waved her hand oh it has been so nice she said feebly and i am so happy but almost before waveney was downstairs molly was asleep well observed everard with a questioning smile have you talked molly into a fever i am afraid we did talk rather too much returned waveney penitently for molly looked very tired when i left but father how weak and thin she is i could not help fretting when i saw her but she looks sweeter than ever dear thing and miss althea's blue dressing-gown is lovely she was quite a picture with that indian silk rug over her feet and all those beautiful flowers beside her ingram again returned everard with a groan do you know he is actually going to eastbourne next week to take lodgings for her and nurse helena and nothing i can say will stop him molly says i am to go too observed waveney anxiously yes dear miss hartford proposed that and i think she is right in saying that you need a change too you are looking thin and pale my child oh i am very well she replied hastily and then anne the heavy-footed came up to tell them that dinner was ready after that as waveney was too restless to stay in the house they went out for a walk and strolled in old ranla gardens and then down the lime walk and along the embankment to chen walk and then as it was growing dusk they walked on quickly to sloane square and everard put her in the train good-bye until sunday father dear were her last words as the train moved off but that night before waveney fell asleep happily in her pansy room nurse helena's homely words reoccurred to her well we are none of us angels but it is my belief that our heavenly father will not be angry with us for loving those he has given us to love thank god for that she murmured and that it is no sin that i love my molly so intensely and in the dying firelight waveney folded her little hands together 
and with a grateful heart said her tedium end of chapter 34 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter 35 of molly's prince this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c molly's prince by rosa nushet carey chapter 35 what am i to say so we grew together like to a double cherry seeming parted and yet a union in partition two lovely berries molded on one stem shakespeare although march set in fierce and blustering as a lion it might have been as mild as any lamb to waveney for when one is young and the blood courses freely in the veins even a nipping east wind and gray skies are not the intolerable hardships that older people feel them especially when a wellspring of joy is bubbling up in the heart molly was getting well that was the keynote of waveney's happiness and although athea shivered and looked depressed as she gazed out at the uninviting prospect and even doreen shrugged her shoulders and made uncomplimentary remarks on the weather waveney only laughed and looked provokingly cheerful i don't mind the long walk one bit she returned in answer to a pitying observation from althea i shall walk as fast as possible and keep myself warm and as for the dust don't you know the old saying that a peck of march dust is worth a king's ransom but althea smiled a little sadly as waveney ran out of the room to put on her hat and jacket how happy the child is she said with an involuntary sigh after all dory when one is growing old it is pleasant to have a bright young creature about the house don't you remember when aunt sarah first suggested that i should have a companion that you looked rather blank and said that our old cosy life would be quite spoiled althea spoke in a rather depressed voice and doreen looked at her anxiously yes i remember she replied quietly the idea quite worried me i was almost cross with aunt sarah for mentioning it but i am glad now that waveney came to us she continued thoughtfully she is a dear little thing and one can't help loving her and then you have found her such a comfort indeed i have was althea's reply she is such a bright intelligent little soul and she has so much tact and sympathy i am afraid i almost begrudge her to molly especially as but here she checked herself you are not feeling quite well dear observed her sister affectionately i hope your eyes are not troubling you but althea shook her head not particularly no don't fuss dory there is nothing really the matter only the east wind is my enemy how is one to feel happy without sunshine and warmth do you remember that march we spent in the riviera and those orange groves and the bed of neapolitan violets under our window how delicious it was but allie dear remonstrated doreen why do you speak in that regretful voice you know aunt sarah wanted you to spend the winter with her at mentone but you refused at once of course i refused returned althea indignantly do you think i was going to leave you alone all the winter besides there was my work what would have become of my porch house thursdays and my classes and library teas oh no dory 
what is the use of putting one's hand to the plow and looking back work has its responsibilities as long as my strength lasts i want to do my own little bit as well and as perfectly as i can and then mitchell came in for the coachman's orders and althea went off to read the letters in the library waveney spent half her time at cleveland terrace as molly grew stronger she yearned incessantly for her sister's companionship and as althea once remarked to everard it seemed useless and cruel to keep them apart and everard fully concurred in this opinion but you are very good to spare my little waveney to us so much he said gratefully and we ought not to take advantage of your kindness the child was here three or four times last week i'm afraid she is neglecting all her duties for molly but though althea was too truthful to deny this she assured him that she was perfectly willing to spare her young companion i don't think i ever saw two sisters so devoted to each other she continued it is really beautiful to see their love for each other it has always been the same returned everard in a moved voice even when they were mere babies molly would refuse to touch her cake unless waveney had half dorothy had to put them to sleep in the same cot or molly would have cried half the night it was the prettiest sight she used to tell me and then he broke up rather abruptly i am an old fool about my girls he said with a little laugh but you see i have had to be mother as well as father for so many years but althea made no answer to this she only bade him good-bye very kindly it was the first time he had mentioned his wife to her dorothy how could his voice have softened as he mentioned the beloved name that morning when waveney made her little speech about a peck of march dust she found a delightful surprise awaiting her at cleveland terrace her father was not at home she knew well it was his day at norwood so she went hastily past the studio door without peeping in as usual but the next moment she saw nurse helena on the threshold beckoning her will you come in here for a minute miss ward she said rather mysteriously and waveney with some surprise retraced her steps and then as she followed her in a little cry of delight broke from her for there was molly pillowing up cosily on the old couch and smiling at her in the most triumphant way oh you darling exclaimed waveney in perfect ecstasy at the sight do you mean that you have actually walked downstairs yes and all by myself too returned molly proudly but do you know wave i have been grumbling dreadfully grumps is not a bit comfortable and she pinched the old maureen cushions rather pettishly but nurse helena promises that i shall have my lovely new couch down to-morrow it will stand quite well in that corner between the window and fireplace and i shall be able to see any one who comes to the gate it is so stupid only to lie and look at the fire of course it is you poor dear but you will soon be watching the waves breaking on the beach so cheer up sweetheart but it was evident that molly was not listening something else was occupying her thoughts her fingers played absently with waveney's curly hair as she knelt beside her then she drew a note from under her pillow nurse helena brought me this on my breakfast tray she said flushing a little as she spoke but i have not answered it yet i want you to tell me what i ought to do then waveney who had recognized ingram's handwriting read it somewhat eagerly 
my dear miss molly was all it said do you think you are well enough to see an old friend i need not tell you what pleasure it will give me if you will allow me to come you shall choose your own day and hour any time from cockcrow to midnight will be equally convenient too yours sincerely monsieur blackie short and sweet observed waveney smiling at the superscription but molly was in no mood for trifling what am i to say she asked anxiously and her eyes looked bright with excitement my darling that is for you to decide are you sure that you are quite strong enough to see mr ingram shall we ask nurse helena what she thinks about it i have asked her replied molly and she said that if i did not stay up too long or tire myself with talking that probably i should be well enough to see a visitor the day after to-morrow well dear shall i write and tell him so shall i ask him to come in the morning or the afternoon oh the afternoon please but waveney and here molly seemed on the verge of tears of course i want to see mr ingram but yet i do dread it so what am i to say to him and how am i to thank him for all he has done i feel quite overwhelmed by it all and then as molly was still very weak one or two tears rolled down her cheeks but waveney kissed them away oh you silly child she said tenderly fancy crying just because a kind friend wants to come and see you why it will do you all the good in the world there is no one so amusing as monsieur blackie take my advice molly dear be as kind to him as you like but don't trouble your poor little head about making him grateful speeches wait until you are stronger you may depend upon it she continued that the black prince has simply been pleasing himself quite as much as he has you i expect generosity is just an amiable vice of his a sort of craze don't you know like he likes playing minor providence in other people's lives it makes him feel warm and comfortable but molly was quite indignant at this you are very clever she said rather petulantly but you talk great nonsense sometimes an amiable vice indeed i should like father to hear that why the other night he said quite seriously that mr ingram has been a perfect godsend to us all and waveney and here molly's voice grew quite plaintive i do feel as though i owe my life to him for if it had not been for sir hindley and nurse helena and nurse miriam i should never have got well for father had no money and what could we have done and here molly broke off with a sob darling do you think i don't know all that returned waveney vexed with herself for her attempt at a joke i would not undervalue mr ingram's kindness for the world he has been our benefactor yours and mine and father's and noel's as for myself i could grovel in the dust at his feet out of sheer gratitude for all his goodness to my molly what i mean to say was this mr ingram does not want our thanks we are his friends and he just loves to help us so be as nice to him as you like sweetheart but don't embarrass him with grateful speeches for you would certainly cry over them and then he will get into a panic and ring violently for nurse helena and then molly laughed and after that they talked with their old cheerfulness indeed waveney was quite wild with spirits for athena had told her that morning that she would give her a month's holiday 
when Molly went to Eastbourne. It so happened that Waveney had promised to spend an hour at the hospital with Corporal Marks on the very afternoon that was fixed for Mr. Ingram's visit. The old man was depressed and ailing. Jonadab has never got over the sergeant's loss, as his sister used to say, and she reminded Molly of this. It just fits in nicely, she observed, for you see, two is company and three's none, and I should have been dreadfully in the way but I should be back in time to make tea for Mr. Ingram, and we will have a cosy little time together. Now, I must go, dear, for I promised Miss Althea that I would not be late. So good-bye until the day after tomorrow. I wish it were tomorrow, whispered Molly feverishly. I do so hate waiting for anything like that. I shall just think about it, and what i am to say until i get quite nervous there don't talk about it any more and molly who looked flushed and tired pushed her gently away waveney had promised to have luncheon with her father before she went to the hospital and when wednesday came she went to the studio to have a peep at the invalid why molly she exclaimed as she entered the room it is quite a transformation scene and indeed the shabby old studio looked wonderfully bright and cosy the round table had been moved to the other side of the room and molly's pretty couch and a low table that ingram had sent for her use were placed between the fireplace and window and a bowl of neapolitan violets was beside her there were flowers everywhere and as for molly oh you dear thing how sweet you look remarked waveney with a hug and indeed molly had never looked more lovely nurse helena had fastened two little pink rosebuds in the lace at her throat and their soft delicate tint just matched molly's cheeks she had a tiny gold vinaigrette in her hand which she showed waveney it came this morning with the flowers she said rather shyly waveney looked at it silently m w was graved on it is it not beautiful wave but i wish i wish he had not sent it when the luncheon was over everett walked with waveney to the door of the hospital he had a tiring afternoon's work before him by tacit consent neither of them spoke much of ingram's visit i hope it will not tire molly too much was all waveney said and once everett hazarded the observation that ingram was sure to be punctual end of chapter thirty five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter thirty six of Molly's Prince. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Molly's Prince by Rosa Nushet Carey. Chapter thirty six. See the Conquering Hero Comes that man that hath a tongue i say is no man if with his tongue he cannot win a woman two gentlemen of verona love looks not with the eyes but with the mind and therefore is winged cupid painted blind a midsummer night's dream as moritz drove to cleveland terrace he carefully rehearsed his part as he had already rehearsed it a dozen times before i am going to see your sister this afternoon he had said to noel at breakfast that morning miss molly i mean have you any message for her no only my love and that sort of thing 
returned noel coolly as he cut himself another slice of bread and then contrary to his custom for he was one of the most talkative and sociable of men ingram relapsed into silence feels a bit grumpy i fancy thought noel with a suppressed grin if i ever have a young woman i wonder if i should feel in that way why the poor old chap has had hardly any breakfast and noel shook his head solemnly and adjusted his pince-nez and then helped himself liberally to the cold game pie ingram's knowledge of invalids and sick rooms was purely rudimentary he had a theory that sick people must be treated like children they must be coaxed amused and made as cheerful as possible there must be no agitation no bringing forward of exciting or perplexing topics no undue warmth of expression and feeling i must be perfectly cool and quiet ingram said to himself as he came in sight of the house i must not let her see what i have gone through all this time monsieur blackie must take no liberties he must be just kind and friendly but as the broughton stopped ingram looked a little pale although he put on his usual sprightly air as he went up the courtyard pride must have its fall says the old proverb and perhaps ingram who was an idealist relied a little too much on his theories and good intentions as donwell would have said he was too cocksure of himself anyhow when anne of the heavy foot ushered him up to the old studio where he and everard ward had passed so many hours of misery and suspense and he saw molly's sweet face flushing and paling with shy pleasure ingram found himself unable to say a word for the sudden choking sensation in his throat he could only stand there like a fool holding the little thin hand that molly had silently held out to him won't you sit down observed molly faintly but her lips trembled as she spoke for ingram's dumb emotion almost frightened her it was so unlike her dear old friend monsieur blackie to stand there without a word of kindly greeting molly's flower-like face grew painfully suffused do please sit down she faltered with a growing sense of discomfort and helplessness ingram did as he was bid but he did not relinquish her hand molly he said and his eyes were dim with a man's trouble and the passionate tenderness that he was trying bravely to repress was so evident in his voice and manner that even molly innocent and guileless as she was thrilled in every nerve perhaps i had better go away he stammered i shall tire you agitate you if i stay i must not say what i think and by heaven i cannot talk platitudes when you have come back from the very valley of the shadow of death molly shall i go for i cannot answer for myself if i remain why should you go returned molly piteously i thought it would be so nice to see you and i wanted so to thank you you have done so much for me waveney told me that you would not like to be thanked but indeed indeed i am grateful grateful to me returned ingram indignantly he dropped her hand molly do you wish to pain me that you say such things to me gratitude when i would willingly give you everything i possess unsay those words my darling he pleaded passionately don't you know that i love you better than anything in the world oh molly dearest if i had lost you i think i should have mourned for you all my life ingram was certainly not acting up to his theory 
monsieur blackie had utterly forgotten his role he had promised himself to keep perfectly cool and collected to be kind and friendly and to avoid all emotion or excitement but before ten minutes had passed he was pouring out his pent-up feelings oh molly dear molly he went on in a broken voice for molly shaken and agitated had hidden her face in her hands all this time i have been trying to win you i want you to be my sweet wife to give me the right to watch over you all my life darling do you think you can care for poor monsieur blackie a little i do care sobbed molly how can i help it when you have been so good to me i think but molly whispered this with her soft cheek pressed against his shoulder as he knelt beside her i think i have cared for you all this time and perhaps that moment's ecstasy fully repaid moritz for all the pain of the last few weeks moritz behaved very well on the whole while the first few minutes of beatitude were over molly's pale cheeks and tearful eyes reminded him that she was an invalid and he forbore to overwhelm her with his delight and gratitude he sat beside her talking quietly while molly lay back on her pillows in languid happiness listening to her lover he was telling her how proud he was of his sobriquet and that no other name would ever be so dear to him as monsieur blackie i hope you will always call me by that name molly darling to you i would always be monsieur blackie but moritz is so much prettier she objected and monsieur blackie would be so long for daily use then ingram hastened to explain in his eager way that he had not meant that of course his wife how molly blushed at that must call him moritz but he never intended to lose his dear old title wave often calls you the black prince returned molly with a low laugh oh dear how wonderful it all seems do you know very shyly i never imagined that any one would ever care for me because of my lameness are you sure that you do not really mind it and here molly's voice grew anxious and even sad i am so awkward and clumsy you know noel often calls me the wobbly one noel will never call you that again returned ingram quite sternly i gave him a good lecture the other day why molly dearest you are simply perfect in my eyes i am afraid to tell you how lovely and dear i think you the wonder is that you could ever bring yourself to care for me for as gwen says i am about as ugly as they make em continued ingram in his quaint way and then molly laughed again although though there were tears in her eyes of sheer joy and gratitude molly was very humble on the subject of her own merits she had no conception how ingram worshipped her sweetness and beauty his crowning triumph had been that monsieur blackie and not viscount ralston had won her love when may laugh at me and call me a fool he thought but her sarcasm and smart speech will not trouble me in the least i have played my little game and got my innings and the loveliest and dearest prize in the world is mine and then he fell to musing blissfully on the surprise in store for his sweetheart what would molly say when he showed her her future home what would she think of brentwood hall and the silent pool and the big conservatory that gwen had called their winter garden and the long picture gallery where in an obscured corner king canute hung as large as life 
Moritz smiled happily to himself as he thought of the family diamonds over which Gwen had gloated, and which he had vainly entreated her to wear. "'Jack would not like it,' Gwen had answered gravely. "'They are for the future Lady Ralston, not for me.' How glad he was now that Gwen's unworldliness and good sense had been proof against the temptation— for in those days how was he to know that a certain sweet molly ward would steal away his heart when molly asked him a little curiously why he was smiling moritz returned without a moment's hesitation that he was merely thanking heaven that she was not rich in worldly goods molly opened her eyes rather widely at this i mean dear that i shall so love to give you all you want he said tenderly but but you are not really rich are you asked molly of course i know you are not poor because of all the lovely things you have given me and and but here molly stopped she had not the courage to mention sir henley's fees no i am not poor returned ingram quietly i have had a nice little property left me by a relative we shall be very comfortable dear and when you are my wife you will not have to bother your poor little head with making ends meet for once he discovered molly shedding tears over her battered little housekeeping book because she had exceeded the week's allowance it was only seven and six pence or some such paltry sum but molly was covered with shame at her own carelessness and ingram who was even in those early days head over ears in love longed to take her in his arms and kiss the tears away yes i think we shall be very comfortable darling went on ingram somewhat hypocritically as he membered with secret glee his thirty thousand a year then as even his inexperienced eyes detected signs of exhaustion in molly's increasing paleness he somewhat quickly dropped the subject molly was not merely tired she was dazed with the wonderful new happiness that had come to her in spite of her love of pretty things her little girlish vanities and harmless ambitions she was far too simple-minded to be really worldly if moritz in the old approved fairy-tale fashion had suddenly filled her lap with diamonds and emeralds they would only have dazzled molly's tired eyes later on perhaps these baubles and adjuncts of rank and wealth would gratify and delight her but at this present moment she would have regarded them with indifference it was the man moritz ingram whom she wanted it was monsieur blackie with all his quaintness his oddities and eccentricities his old-world chivalry and true manly tenderness whom molly loved and honoured molly with all her simplicity and childliness had been wiser than most women in going straight to the root of the matter it was nothing to her that her chosen lover was short of stature a small dark man with a sallow skin and closely cropped hair that would have done credit to a convict molly saw nothing but the kind dear eyes and pleasant smile and she would not have exchanged him for any adonis though he stood six feet in his stockings moritz's conscience was uneasy more than once he had made an effort to go but molly's soft little hand had kept him a willing prisoner waveney will be here directly she said she has promised to make tea for us and at that very moment waveney entered the room the lamp had not been lighted and only the firelight threw a flickering uncertain glow over the two faces before her 
but something in mr ingram's attitude in the very atmosphere of the warm flower-scented room made waveney's heart beat with quick sympathetic throbs oh what is it she said stumbling a little in her haste but as she put out her hands to save herself ingram caught them in his own my little samaritan he said affectionately do you know i am going to be your brother will you wish me joy dear and then in his airy foreign fashion moritz lifted her hand to his lips my brother gasped waveney well she had expected it but all the same she felt a little giddy molly's prince had come as she knew he would and would carry molly away darling come here and molly stretched out her arms almost piteously wave why do you stand there as though you were turned to stone don't you want me to be happy she whispered as waveney at this appeal knelt down beside her oh molly returned poor waveney i know that i ought to be glad and i am glad but with a sob that would not be kept back but but i have lost my old sweetheart never returned molly energetically and her arms were around her sister's neck as she spoke wave dear you must not say such things nothing nothing can ever come between us or make our love less kiss me darling she went on and promise me that you will never say that again and then as waveney stooped over her she whispered in her ear after all i have found out the best way of thanking him perhaps it was as well that nurse helena made her appearance at that moment with the lamp and so broke up the agitated little group waveney got up feeling rather guilty when nurse helena commented somewhat severely on molly's flushed and tired face there has been too much talking she said in her quiet authoritative voice miss molly must have her tea and go upstairs and rest and then she regarded ingram rather suspiciously nevertheless when she went out of the room there was an amused twinkle in the nurse's grey eyes when anne brought the, up the tea tray waveney was assiduous in her attentions to molly and her fiance she chatted to ingram in her old frank way molly was to rest and listen to them she was to enjoy her tea and the delicate tongue sandwiches that nurse helena had cut so carefully but nurse helena was right and there must be no more talking and then she amused them both by retailing to them the corporal's odd speeches directly tea was over ingram took his leave before nurse helena turns me out he observed with a laugh waveney who waited for him outside was somewhat taken aback at the length of the farewell parting is such sweet sorrow she said to herself but she sighed as she said it waveney who was bitten with the same disease was certainly not disposed to be hypercritical on the behaviour of the lovers she had a few words with molly before nurse came to claim her charge oh wave i cannot understand it molly exclaimed and her eyes looked bright and excited fancy me being engaged before you i who never expected to have a lover of my own dearest you must love him for my sake he is so good oh there is no one like him and molly seemed almost appalled at the magnitude of her bliss waveney had promised to wait for her father he was to put her into the train and althea had directed her to take a cab from durham station straight to the red house everett was somewhat later than usual and they had only a little while together 
he listened to the wonderful news with the air of a man who had fully expected it i knew ingram would steal a march on us he said rubbing his hands together i told him to wait until the child was stronger and i thought he agreed to this but you can never depend on a man when he is in love and so molly really cares for him went on everard in a pleased voice well she is a sensible girl and does me credit as for ingram he is a capital fellow a son-in-law after my own heart went on everard with a smile that perplexed waveney it was so mysterious and yet so full of amusement end of chapter thirty six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter number thirty seven of molly's prince this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c molly's prince by rosa nugent carey chapter thirty seven a devout lover a man he seems of cheerful yesterdays and confident to-morrows woodsworth i do perceive here a divided duty othello when waveney broke the news of molly's engagement to her friends at the red house the sisters only looked at each other with a meaning smile so that is the end of the comedy observed althea in an amused voice all's well that ends well eh dory of course we all knew how it would end that evening at the theatre to be sure we did returned doreen complacently nothing ever ruffled her placidity if people choose to be engaged or married it was their affair not hers doreen never envied them never drew unfavourable comparisons between her friends matrimonial bliss and her own single blessedness she had walked contentedly in maiden meditation fancy free all these years i was cut out for an old maid she would say sometimes laughingly to her sister the role just suits me you are different she once added looking rather wistfully at althea as she spoke yes replied althea frankly you and i are different people dory you are the happiest and most contented woman i know but a little pathetically i have not had all my good things and though she said no more doreen understood her it is very odd to think that pretty little molly ward is to be a connection of ours went on doreen when Waveney had bidden them good night. Waveney's heart was so full that she yearned to be alone in her pansy room and think over the day's excitement. Molly will be our cousin. And as Althea assented to this with a smile, she continued, I wonder what Gwen will think of her new sister-in-law. My dear Dory, I think I can answer that. Gwen will be charmed with her you know how much gwen thinks of beauty and where will you find a sweeter face than molly's then she is such a dear little unsophisticated thing ah gwen will lose her heart to her you may depend on that upon my word she went on i think moritz has not chosen so badly after all indeed for an idealist he has done very well for himself and i shall write and congratulate him most cordially molly will make a most fascinating little vicontness she will have much to learn of course but she will be no faint-hearted lady of burley sinking weakly under the burden of an honour into which she was not born finished althea with a little laugh and then as the old grandfather's clock in the hall struck ten doreen rang the bell for prayers 
Althea did more than write her letter of congratulation. She drove down all the way to Cleveland Terrace a day or two afterwards to see Molly and wish her joy, and she was so kind and sympathetic she praised Moritz and said so many nice things about him that Molly was ready to worship her for her tact and gentleness. Molly's pretty bloom was returning to her cheeks, and on her left hand there was a splendid half-hoop of diamonds. She showed her ring to Althea with a child's shy eagerness. It is far too beautiful, she said proudly, but he did not buy it for me. It belonged to that old relative who left him the property. Oh, indeed, returned Althea with polite interest, but there was an amused gleam in her eyes. Of course, the ring had belonged to old Lady Ralston, who had been a beauty and an heiress, and whose diamonds had been the envy of all the dowagers at the county ball. And then Moritz had come in and interrupted them. He was evidently taken aback at the sight of his cousin Althea, but her cordial welcome and her warm congratulations soon restored his equanimity, and he was soon chatting to her and Molly in his old light-hearted fashion. Molly was to go down to Eastbourne the following week, and the two girls were to be chaperoned by Nurse Helena. Molly was recovering her strength so fast that Nurse Helena's office was likely to be sincere, but when Althea pointed this out very gently to Moritz, he put his foot down very decidedly. Of course Molly was getting better, he said, with an air of an autocrat, and the sea breezes would soon set her up. But how could his cousin Althea imagine that two girls could be alone at a place like Eastbourne? The very idea shocked him. As Mr. Ward could not leave town except from Saturday to Monday, he had insisted that Nurse Helena should be put in charge. I shall run down myself every few days, he finished, and I suppose one has to study the proprieties. Then Althea very wisely held her peace. Moritz went to the station to see them off. The girls were in high spirits, and Molly, who knew that she would see him again before many days were over, could hardly sum up gravity enough to bid him good-bye. It was Moritz who looked melancholy. London was a howling wilderness to him without his darling. He had sent Noel back to keep house with his father, and he meant to go down to Brentwood Hall and seek consolation with Gwen and her boy. Gwen would give him all the sympathy he demanded. She was as romantic and unconventional as he was. Gwen dearly liked a lover. She would listen patiently to all his discourse on Molly's perfections, and she would help him with the decorations and the refurnishing of the rooms that were to be got ready for his young wife. Moritz, who had been such a patient wooer, was now in hot haste to clinch his bargain. Molly, startled and protesting, had been carried away by his masterful eloquence, and had signed away her freedom. They were to be married in the middle of August, and to spend their honeymoon at his shooting box in the Highlands. The moorland air would be good for Molly, he said and they and the grouse would have it to themselves. I don't hold with rushing about from place to place on one's wedding trip, he observed to Althea, for he had his theories on this subject also. When Jack and Gwen were married, they went off to the Austrian Tyrol, and heaven knows where besides. But I know a thing or two better than that. The hut is a cosy little place, and there are some comfortable rooms in it. I will send down Murdoch. He is a Highlander and a handy fellow, too, and his wife is a capable woman. 
to make things shipshape for a lady we will have a few days in edinburgh first and show molly holyrood and arthur's seat and she shall feast her eyes on the shops in prince's street for moritz remembered with lover-like accuracy molly's girlish penchant for shop windows moritz could be practical on occasion and he somewhat astonished althea when he took her into his confidence by his thoughtfulness for his young fiancée's comfort it was to his cousin althea that moritz entrusted the formidable but delightful task of ordering the trousseau gwen was too far from london to undertake such an onerous business he had already talked the matter over with mr ward and had wrung from him a reluctant consent even everard's pride and independence could not resist morris's urgent entreaties that a trousseau befitting molly's future rank should be provided at his expense but before this could be done molly must see her future home and be made aware of her splendid position and for this purpose it was arranged that when the month at eastbourne was over she should pay a visit to the red house and then moritz's long deferred picnic to brentwood should take place althea had her own little plans which she did not impart to moritz although she had already talked them over with waveney you know my dear child she said seriously to her the evening before waveney started for eastbourne i have been thinking a great deal of you and molly and i have made up my mind to part with my dear little companion what can you mean asked waveney in a startled voice but she flushed uneasily i know i have been very little use to you lately and that i have neglected my duties shamefully but i was going to speak to you about that i want you to give me less money indeed indeed as althea looked extremely amused at this i am quite serious i have not earned my salary and i cannot take it it would not be honest and here waveney drew up her slight figure and looked very resolute why waveney my dear child remonstrated althea surely you are not going to disappoint me after all these months i thought we were such good friends you and i that we understood each other thoroughly and as the girl looked at her in dumb questioning she continued affectionately dear friends do not differ for a trifle or stand on their dignity what are a few pounds more or less compared to all you and molly have done for me how do you mean dear miss althea asked waveney quite taken aback at this i have done little enough i know and as for molly you have brought fresh interests into my life returned althea quietly you have given me two more human beings to serve and love yes she continued but her voice was not quite steady i am very fond of you and your pretty molly and it adds to my happiness to feel that i am any help or comfort to either of you comfort what should i have done without you replied waveney with emotion my own mother could hardly have been kinder and more patient then althea flushed slightly well then you will be a good child and let me finish what i have to say and then in her clear sensible way she explained her views about the future when molly married waveney would have to leave them it was impossible for her father and noel to do without her and waveney who had not taken this into consideration felt a sudden thrill of pain at the idea of leaving the red house as this was the case went on althea she and doreen both agreed it would be cruel to part her and molly 
during the few months that remained to them mollie was coming to the red house for some weeks to do her shopping but when she went back to cleveland terrace waveney must go with her that is why i say that you and i must part my child finished althea gently i shall miss my bright companion sadly so sadly indeed that i never mean to have another but waveney your father has the first claim to your services i dare not deprive him of your society when molly has gone there we will not talk any more as she saw that waveney's eyes were full of tears think over what i have said when you are at eastbourne and take molly into your confidence i know she will say that i am right and indeed when waveney consulted her molly who was a very sensible little person fully endorsed queen bess's opinion of course i could not do without you darling she remarked with decision moritz she always said his name so prettily and shyly would not like me to be alone and as for father and noel they would be too uncomfortable with only that stupid anne to look after them and then waveney owned with a sigh that she and miss althea were right waveney took herself to task severely for her reluctance at leaving the red house was she guilty of loving the flesh pots of egypt was her home to be less to her because molly would not be there waveney cried shame to herself because the thought of anne's clumsiness fretted her while the meagre housekeeping and all the pretty economies that had been molly's share and were now to be shifted to her shoulders filled her with a sore distaste and loathing she had grown to love the red house and every room in it the luxury the comfort the perfection of the train service the home-like atmosphere the cultured society of the two sisters and their wide work and sympathies all appealed strongly to waveney's nature her life in the red house had been a liberal education how much she had learnt there and then the porch house thursdays but at this point in her reflections waveney checked herself abruptly too well she knew where the sting lay and why the pain of leaving erpingham would be so sharp and continuous only there could she enjoy the society of mr chater and she knew well that at cleveland terrace her thursdays would be blank and sad wave dear exclaimed molly on that first evening as they were together in their comfortable sitting-room looking out on the parade and the sea while nurse helena was busy in the room unpacking their boxes isn't this one of our dreams come true that you and i should be at the seaside together it was your dream not mine molly returned waveney in a teasing voice you were the dreamer in the old days i was far more prosaic and matter-of-fact and then she settled herself more comfortably against molly's couch there were your kitlands dream you know and a hundred others oh never mind kitlands replied molly with a touch of impatience in her voice that was a dear dream but of course it was too big and grand ever to come true but how often we used to make believe that we were going to the seaside don't you remember wave the little bow window parlor over the tinman's in high street that we used to take and the sea breezes that would meet us as we turned the corner and how we were always to have shrimps for tea and then molly laughed with glee but this is much better isn't it dear and she looked at the big cosy room that ingram had selected for their use 
they were like a pair of happy children that evening molly had insisted that she and waveney should share the big front bedroom and she was so wide awake and excited that she would have talked half the night only waveney sternly refused to be cajoled nurse helena has begged us not to talk she said and i feel i am on my honor no molly i will not be coaxed i am a woman of my word and i gave nurse helena my promise there shall be no pale cheeks for the black prince to see on saturday go to sleep like a good child and then molly consented to be silent it was a happy month and nothing occurred to mar their enjoyment they spent delightful mornings on the beach or parade in the afternoon while molly had her siesta waveney and nurse helena wrote their letters or enjoyed the books with which ingram had provided them after tea when the evenings were fine and warm they drove into the country coming back to an early supper moritz always came down from saturday to monday and put up at the hotel close by once he brought mr ward with him and another time it was noel and then indeed molly's happiness was complete only one thing troubled molly as the days went on in spite of her high spirits waveney was not quite herself she had silent fits at times she was absent and distrait and did not always hear what molly said to her and more than once as they sat in the moonlight looking at the silvery path across the dark sea molly had heard a suppressed sigh there is something on her mind something she is keeping to herself thought molly anxiously and we have never never had a secret from each other it is not like my own wave to hide anything from me and i shall tell her so and indeed molly was so tearful and pleading so pertinacious in her questions and so quick and clever in her surmises that before they returned to the red house waveney's poor little secret her unfinished story was in molly's keeping molly was full of tender sympathy she cried bitterly over waveney's description of that meeting by the river she quaked and shivered was hot and cold by turns with excitement of course he cares for you darling she said putting her arms round her sister's neck how can he help it oh it will all come right she continued cheerfully one day you will be as happy as we are what a pity he is so poor and proud men are so blind it would be so much nicer to be engaged and wait oh any number of years went on molly with womanly philosophy but to this waveney made no answer perhaps in her secret heart she was glad molly knew never in their lives had they had a thought unshared by the other but when molly was alone she made a naughty little mouche how can she care for that plain old-looking man she said to herself why i should be frightened to speak to him he looks so grave waveney is a hundred times too good for him a noticeable man with large gray eyes is not to my taste went on molly with a blissful remembrance of her own dear monsieur blackie end of chapter twenty seven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter thirty eight of molly's prince this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen 
vancouver b c molly's prince by rosa nushet carey chapter thirty eight molly's prince and while now she wonders blindly nor the meaning can divine proud turns he round and kindly all of this is thine and mine the lord of burley it is all arranged about the picnic exclaimed molly in a joyous voice as she entered their bedroom where waveney was busy packing her own and molly's things it was the last day before their return to town moritz had come down unexpectedly the previous evening and had paid his usual morning visit he had gone back to the hotel to write his letters and had promised to join them on the parade later on what picnic observed waveney absently she was at that moment regarding with great satisfaction the new spring dresses that had just come from the dressmakers they had been bought with her own money and the pretty hats and smart boots and gloves had all been provided from her quarter salary and although molly had at first refused to allow waveney to spend her money on her she was soon persuaded that any shabbiness on the part of his young fiance would be distressing to mr ingram's feelings you know he likes people to be nicely dressed waveney had remarked rather severely so please don't be foolish molly surely in a pathetic voice you won't begrudge me this last chance of buying clothes for my sweetheart and what could molly do after that except hug her silently in token of yielding what picnic returned molly indignantly why our long-promised visit to brentwood hall of course to see dear old king canute in the picture moritz says he has arranged everything with miss althea i am to have a day's rest at the red house and on thursday we are to go but miss althea is always engaged on thursday objected waveney she has her porch house evening oh yes i know retorted molly she was fairly glowing with excitement and happiness but miss althea says she doesn't mind being absent for once we are to drive down to waterloo and moritz will meet us there and it's only a hour's journey by train moritz says that his sister has promised to join us at luncheon i was just a wee bit frightened when he said that but he assured me she would not be the least formidable she is very tall waveney and very plain at least strangers think her so and she always calls herself ugly but she was sure i should soon love her gwen is the dearest girl in the world he went on and jack just worships her jack compton is her husband you know oh wave i do hope she will like me of course she will like you returned waveney with comfortable decision i would not give a fig for miss gwen if she had the bad taste not to admire my molly well i hope it will be a fine day for moritz's picnic and then we can wear our new dresses but molly dear are we really to have luncheon at brentwood hall i thought moritz said his friend was away and that only servants were there yes but he says he and lord ralston are such close friends that he has carte blanche to do as he likes he is viscount ralston and he is very rich moritz says he has over thirty thousand a year he seems to have very grand friends went on molly rather thoughtfully i am afraid they will look down on me a poor little lame cinderella but waveney scouted this idea with energy molly was well born and well educated no one could look down on her 
Moritz would not have to blush for her, even if his friends were dukes as well as viscounts. Molly must hold her own, and not be too humble on the subject of her own merits. It was quite evident that Moritz thought her the dearest and sweetest thing in the world, and she ought to be satisfied with that. And then Molly cheered up and forgot her fears, and they packed happily until it was time to go out. When the eventful day arrived, Molly woke Waveney at an unconsciously early hour to inform her that the weather was simply perfect and that they might wear their new dresses without fear of a shower. It was one of those typical May days when nature puts on her dandiest and fairest apparel, when the fresh young green of the foliage seems to feast and rest the eyes. The air was sweet with lilac and may, and the tender blue of the sky was unstained by a single cloud. When Molly came downstairs in her pretty gray dress with a little spray of pink may at her throat, Althea thought that she matched the day itself. Molly has quite recovered her looks, she said to Doreen. The dear child is a great beauty, and Gwen will be charmed with her. And indeed, as they drove through, there were many admiring glances cast at the pretty, blushing face. Moritz was at the station to meet them. He had a white flower in his buttonhole and looked jubilant and excited. Perhaps he was a trifle fussy in his attentions. Molly must take his arm, he said. The station was so crowded and there were a lot of rough people about. Poor Molly felt a little nervous and conscious. It was difficult to adapt her slow, lurching walk to Monsieur Blackie's quick, springy tread. Moritz might be as tender over her infirmity as a mother over some crippled child, but Molly, who was only human, could have wept over her own awkwardness. Perhaps her limping gait had never given her more acute pain than now, when Ingram was trying so carefully and laboriously to adapt his step to hers. Molly's cheeks were burning by the time they reached their compartment, but when Moritz sat down beside her with a fond look and word, she forgot her uneasiness and was her own happy self again. The journey was a short one. When they reached Brentwood, Moritz hurried his party through the little country station before the station master had an opportunity of accosting him. An open barouche with a fine pair of bays was awaiting them. When Waveney admired them, Moritz remarked rather complacently that Ralston was a good judge of horse flesh, and then he asked Molly how she would like to drive herself in a low pony carriage with a pair of cream-colored ponies and molly thinking that he was joking clapped her hands gleefully how delicious that would be she returned but it is very naughty of you to tantalize me in this fashion oh what a dear old village she went on and moritz the people seem to know you for moritz was lifting his hat every instant in response to some greeting Oh, they are always civil to people who are staying at the hall, returned Ingram, evasively. But at that moment he met Althea's amused glance. Very well done, my lord, she said under her breath, and then she shook her head at him. They were just turning in at some open gates, and before them was a shady avenue. At the end some more gates and finely wrought flemish work admitted them to the sunny gardens and terrace while before them stood the grand old hall with its gray walls and quaint gables and oriel windows embroidered in ivy and creepers 
It is a lovely old place, murmured Althea, but Molly and Waveney were speechless with admiration. To their eyes it looked like an enchanted palace, surrounded by shimmering green lawns. The great door was wide open, as though to receive them, but there was no sign of human life. When the carriage had driven by, Moritz took Molly's hand and led her across the wide hall with its pillars and grand oak carvings, its mighty fireplace and walls covered with curious weapons, with here and there a stag's antlers or the head of a grinning leopard. They only paused for a moment to admire the great stone staircase that was broad enough for a dozen men to walk abreast. One of the Ralstons, in a mad frolic, had once ridden his gallant grey up to the very top of the staircase. "'I'm going to show you everything,' observed Ingram, as they walked down the softly carpeted corridor. "'We call this the zoo,' he continued. "'For if you look at the pictures, Molly, you will see they are mostly of animals. There are some good proof engravings of Landseer and the sculpture is rather fine, but the most beautiful groups are in the picture gallery upstairs. The fifth Viscount Ralston was a connoisseur of art, and spent a good deal of his income in pictures and sculptures. It was he who brought the Flemish gates from Belgium. They are considered very fine, and are always pointed out to visitors." Molly began to feel a little breathless. She wanted to linger in every room, but Moritz, who had his work cut out for him, hurried her on. They went through the big dining room, which was large enough for a banqueting hall, and into a smaller one where the table was already laid for luncheon, and then into the library and morning room. When Molly asked, with naive curiosity, if there were no drawing-room moritz laughed and told her to wait these are ralston's private quarters he said ushering her into a cosy sitting-room fitted up for a gentleman's use but when molly would have investigated with girlish curiosity the mass of papers on the writing-table he quietly took her arm and marched her into the billiard-room adjoining Ralston would not like us to look at his papers, he said gravely. He is an untidy fellow, and his writing table is always in confusion. Is Lord Ralston married? asked Molly. Presently, as they went slowly up the stone staircase, Althea, who overheard her, was obliged to pause. She was shaking with suppressed mirth but Waveney was far too busily engaged in admiring a painted window to notice her merriment. Ingram was quite equal to the occasion. He is not married yet, dear, he returned quickly, but he does not expect to be a bachelor much longer. Shall I show you the rooms that he has chosen for his future wife, or shall we go to the picture gallery? But Molly's excitement was too great for fatigue, and she at once desired to see Lady Ralston's rooms. To Molly's inexperienced eyes they were grand enough for the Queen. She was almost indignant when Moritz exclaimed that the boudoir and dressing-room were to be refurnished. It was shameful extravagance, she repeated more than once. What did it matter if the furniture was a little old-fashioned? Molly was quite eloquent on the subject, as she stood in the wide bay window of the boudoir. It was a charming window. Molly looked straight down the avenue to the great bronze gates. The rooks were cawing in the elms. Some tame pheasants were pluming themselves on the lawn below and a wicked-looking jackdaw was strutting up and down the terrace. The beds were full of spring flowers. "'Oh, how perfect it all is!' sighed Molly, and then she said, 
in quite a decided tone i do think it will be wicked for lord ralston to refurnish this room there gwen do you hear that exclaimed moritz and molly turned hastily around a tall young lady was standing in the doorway watching her she was quite young but molly thought she had never seen any one so tall and certainly it was her opinion that first moment that mrs john compton was the plainest person she had ever seen molly who was a great admirer of beauty felt a sort of shock at the sight of gwen's frank ugliness her small greenish blue eyes crinkling up with amusement the bluntness of her features and her wide mouth gave molly a pang she had yet to find out her redeeming points her beautiful figure the rich brown hair and pleasantly modulated voice moritz is this my dear new sister asked gwen with a smile so bright and warm that it quite transfigured her plain face and then with frank kindness she put her arms round molly and kissed her molly you must be very good to me she went on and now there were tears in her eyes moritz is my only brother and we have been everything to each other have we not old boy and gwen pinched his ear playfully and then greeted waveney and her cousin althea in the warmest fashion there was a little hubbub of talking and laughter and then moritz drew molly's arm through his and led her away probably gwen had had her orders for instead of following them she made room for waveney on the wide window seat there is something moritz wishes me to tell you she said quietly and that he is telling your sister now however important moritz's communication might be it had to be deferred until molly had exhausted her whole vocabulary of admiring terms at the sight of the noble gallery it was a drawing-room and ballroom as well as a picture gallery three great fireplaces with their cosy environment of luxurious lounges and easy chairs gave warmth to the whole room and on the other side were windows with deep recesses every one forming separate cosy nooks in one was a low tea table and a circle of easy chairs another was fitted with an inlaid writing table and cabinet a third contained only a low velvet divan it was in this last recess that moritz at last contrived to detain molly dear molly he said gently but firmly there will be plenty of time to look at the pictures and sculpture after luncheon but i want you to listen to me a moment i have to ask your forgiveness for a little deception moritz's face was so grave that molly regarded him with astonishment my forgiveness are you joking moritz no darling i am quite serious i have brought you here under false pretenses but i will tell you all about it by and by dearest this is your future home it is here that you and i are to spend our lives together moritz ingram and viscount ralston are one and the same person molly's face grew white the little hand he held trembled with emotion oh no not really she gasped yes really my sweet one but i cannot have you look so pale and frightened then as molly glanced shyly at him he caught her suddenly to his breast my little blessing he whispered you loved your old friend monsieur blackie but you will not tell me now i hope that ralston is to be less dear to you no no stammered molly but i cannot understand oh moritz why did you do it i will tell you dear he returned quietly 
you know at one time gwen and i were very poor we lived in a poky little house that we called the tin shanty you shall see it some day and i think you will own that tin cleveland terrace is a mansion compared with it we were almost at the end of our tether when the death of a cousin made me viscount ralston and master of brentwood hall and thirty thousand a year oh moritz and molly shivered and hid her face i was a lucky fellow was i not dear and i was truly thankful for my good things i was always very sociable and fond of society of my fellow creatures and when gwen married i led rather a gay life but after a time i got disgusted mothers with marriageable daughters made a dead set at me before the season was over i could have had my pick of half a dozen beauties viscount ralston with his thirty thousand a year was considered a desirable parti molly dear it fairly sickened me you know i was an idealist and i never could make up my mind to move in the ordinary groove like other people and i registered a mental vow that unless i was loved for myself i would never marry when i first met my little samaritan i had no wish to disclose my title but it was a mere freak at first to remain incognito until until i saw you my darling oh molly do you remember that day and how i heard you singing and discovered cinderella sitting on the hearth shall i tell you a secret dear when i left the house that day i said to myself i will move heaven and earth to win that girl for my wife oh moritz did you really yes love and then and there i decided to be mr ingram i had no difficulty in preserving my incognito i bound over my cousins to secrecy it was only her illness that complicated matters i found then that it was necessary to take your father and noel into confidence but you and waveney were to be kept in ignorance when is telling her at this present moment but now molly i have finished my confession and i only want to hear from your lips that monsieur blackie is forgiven there is nothing to forgive she faltered i think i am glad that i did not know but oh moritz there is one thing that makes me sorry and now there was a painful flush on molly's cheek you know what i mean i wish for your sake that i was not lame my poor little darling he returned compassionately but i think i love you all the more for your helplessness thank heaven my wife will never have occasion to tire herself the cream-colored ponies are in the stable molly and when we are married i mean to give you riding lessons and then for very joy and gratitude molly burst into a flood of happy tears oh it is too much too much she sobbed i do not deserve such happiness moritz you must teach me everything i want to be worthy of this lovely home and you and then shyly but with exquisite grace she lifted the kind hand to her lips end of chapter thirty eight recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c